to Student of the Gun Radio. I am your host, Paul Markle, and we are pleased to be a part of the Firearms Radio Network. And thank you for joining us for this inaugural show. Now, with me in the studio today is my studio engineer, Jared, and he's going to be helping me out this entire season, trying to make me look good on the radio. We could not bring you this show without the support of our sponsors. So before we get into it, we want to take a moment to thank them. We want to thank Keltec Firearms of Cocoa, Florida. You can check them out at keltecweapons.com. And we also want to thank Crossbreed Holsters of Republic, Missouri. Now, their website is crossbreedholsters.com, so give them a look. Now, that uh, music you heard at the very beginning, that is the official rock band of Student of the Gun. It is Madison Rising. If you haven't had the opportunity to check them out yet, I would highly recommend that you do so. Go to madisonrising.com. You can find out about their tour dates, their CDs, and so forth. And, of course, you can go to YouTube and you can watch their videos. Now, it is obviously our inaugural episode, and I think a lot of you may not have uh, heard of Student of the Gun before. Uh, And if you're not familiar with Student of the Gun, I should probably give you a quick bio. Now, I became a United States Marine in 1987. I've been a police officer, I've been a bodyguard, I've been a full-time firearms and uh, marksmanship instructor, and I've been writing professionally for about 20 years for a number of outdoor journals and so forth, and I have a couple of books to my credit, including a book called Student of the Gun, A Beginner Once, A Student for Life, and that really sums up our motto here at Student of the Gun. We believe that once you consider yourself an expert or once you feel that you know enough you stop learning. And everybody's a beginner once, but you really should be a student for life. Your entire life, you should be striving to learn and improve more and more. And that's really what we're all about. We're about entertainment, education, and enlightenment when it comes to firearms. They say, well, what is student of the gun all about? Or what are we going to talk about? Is it going to be you know, personal defense? Is it going to be sporting clays? Well, if it goes bang, we're probably going to talk about it. Uh, We don't pigeonhole ourselves to just one specific subject. But today, for our inaugural episode, I had to come up with a topic. And All right, what am I going to talk about right now? And it it really was a bit of a no-brainer because what is every shooter in America talking about? Well, we're talking about the ammo shortage or the ammo crunch. And we need to take a second to consider whether or not it's an actual ammo shortage or whether or not it's a customer surplus. Now, I'm coming to you from Biloxi, Mississippi, which is on the Gulf Coast, and it is in the hurricane belt. And every year, people who live on the Gulf Coast, they know that, hey, after June 1st, it's hurricane season. So what do you do? Well, you you check your cupboards, you know, you check your your stock of food and water and so forth. You know, you stock up on the toilet paper just in case. And you do that because you know that there may be a storm and you just need to be prepared. Now, when there actually is a storm brewing around out there in the Gulf Coast, the closer that the storm the storm gets, the more excited people get. And those who, you know, like the ant and the grasshopper, those who did not prepare start getting antsy. And what do they do? You know, the storm's three days off the coast. People start running out to the store. They run out to Walmart, Kmart, the grocery stores, what have you, and they start buying up all the canned goods, and they start buying up all the bottled water, and so on and so forth. And it gets to the point where, you know, the hurricane's 24 hours offshore. You go to Walmart, guess what they don't have any of? They don't have any candles, no flashlights, no batteries, no bottled water. And it's not because there's a candle, flashlight, and battery shortage in America. It's because you went from a normal 100% customer base to a 1,000% customer base. And that's really what we've found in the United States of America right now. You know, the ammo companies were making ammunition to satisfy X number of customers, an average of X. Well, we went from X to Y to Z to double A. We went from a 100% customer base for ammo to a 1,000% customer base. And just from a practical standpoint, you can't walk out onto the manufacturing floor at you know Winchester or Remington and say, hey, guys, uh, we know that you've been making ammo three shifts a day, seven days a week, but what we need you to do is go ahead and increase your production from 100% to 1,000%. Could you do that for us? Thanks a lot. You, they just can't do it. Uh, those of you that have been paying attention know that uh, in 2008, And going into 2009, 
we had a, a serious spike in the sale of personal defense firearms. And along with those, we had a serious spike in ammunition sales. So a lot of the major companies, if they weren't already working seven days a week, uh, three shifts a day, they increased production. All the major players, Federal ATK, Winchester, Remington, they're all making ammo around the clock. And then you have other companies like Hornady and Corbon and Black Hills. They're all making as much ammunition as they have machines and manpower to make. You say, well, all right, you tell me that, Paul, but that still doesn't help me. You know, I go to Walmart or I go to my local gun shop, and he says, well, you're only allowed to buy two boxes of ammo today for a specific caliber. Or I go to Walmart in the afternoon and the shelves are bare. That doesn't help me. Well, folks, people who hadn't bought a box of ammunition in five years this December ran out and bought 1,000 rounds. Uh, or people that usually go through 100 rounds a month went out and bought 1,000 rounds. Everybody who owns a gun went out and bought ammo. And not only did they buy ammo, but they bought ammo for guns that they didn't even own. And some of you are listening to me right now. You know what I'm talking about. People were buying 22 long rifle and in planning to use it as currency. And and you laugh, but that's that's why you can't find 22 because the minute it hits the shelves, someone sees it, they walk over and they buy it. Gone are the days of, well, I'm going to go to the range today. On the way to the range, I'll just stop by Walmart and I'll pick up a few boxes of ammunition. You can't do that. You've got to plan ahead. You say, well, okay, we, we're, we've addressed that. We understand that there is a, a super surplus of customers for ammunition right now. Uh, so how do we deal with that? Well, there's a few ways. Well, number one, if you're paying close attention, you'll notice that the back orders that your local gun shop put in, you know, if you've got a, you know, a down the street gun shop, a gun dealer that you like dealing with, most of the smart ones started putting in orders in September, October, November, and even to December. And those back orders are starting to show up. Now, it's not coming in truckloads, but it is there. Uh, my local gun shop, Cook's Gun Shop of Biloxi, Mississippi, uh, that's exactly what they did. You know, they started buying a little bit extra or a little bit more than they normally would back in November, and then they did it in December and so forth. And so those back orders that were two months back ordered in November and December are now starting to show up. Now, they don't have absolutely everything you need, but they've got more than they did, say, a month or two ago. And... Uh, the smart guys, the, the intelligent ones, they're not going to let you walk in and buy every round of 45 ACP they have on, on the shelves. They just can't do it. Think about it. If you went in and you say, I've got my checkbook, I want to buy all 2,500 rounds of 45 you've got, and they say, all right, here you go. Well, now the next 5, 6, 10, 12 customers that come in are going to be disappointed. Not only that, but think about it. If you're a, a small to medium-sized gun shop, and you've got 45 ACP pistols on the shelf, you sell some guy 2,000 rounds, now you've got pistols and you've got no ammo to sell with them. And people aren't going to buy a gun if they can't buy ammunition for it. So they're rationing. Now, the smart guys that are rationing are also not gouging. And that's something that to, you know, to be considered. I know there is price gouging going on out there. And unfortunately, a lot of the price gougers, there's, they, you know, they look at you and they're like, hey, bro, Supply and demand, you want it, you're going to pay the price that I'm asking. Or if you complain, they'll say, hey, it's not me, it's the manufacturer. Well, because I've been writing professionally for 20 years now, I've developed relationships with all the big, you know, all the ammunition manufacturers. I was just at the SHOT Show in Las Vegas, Nevada two months ago in January, and I, I talked to all my contacts at, at the, and I said, hey, tell me the truth, have you guys... Uh, raised your rates, you know, ha have you bumped up your prices? And across the biggest price increase I could find that one company actually said that in the last three years, they've had a 20% increase, which is reasonable. Uh, the average is either zero to 5% price increase. It's not 100, 200, 300% price increase. So if you go into a shop, you go into, you know, Joe's pawn shop, and he wants $50 for a box of 45 ACP ammo, and he tells you, oh, it's not me, it's the manufacturer. I think he's pulling your leg a little bit right there. Uh, I wouldn't pay $50 for a box of it, of course. I also thought enough to stockpile some. And a lot of you guys out there, you're shaking your heads. You're like, yeah, I knew this was coming, and I stockpiled my ammo. Which brings me to my next point. A lot of folks out there, 
uh, myself included, if you go to your ammo locker, if you go to your gun safe and you open it up and you start picking through, you probably will find boxes of ammunition for guns that you don't even have anymore. You know, you had a thirty out six rifle and you bought ammo for it, but then you traded it for something else, but you still have a hundred rounds of thirty out six or thirty thirty or you name it. Now is a good time to trade that ammunition for something that you need. And what I'm going to propose right now here on Student of the Gun Radio is if you are a member of a local shooting sports club, uh, you know, you, you, you're you a member of a club where people go and they drink coffee and, and tell tall tales and shoot guns occasionally, what I would do is I'd, you know, approach my club officers and say, hey, let's do ammo swap Saturdays. And it's as simple as this. Just tell everybody in the club, look, Saturday morning at 9, from 9 to 11, we're going to set up some tables and bring your ammo, and we're going to barter. Just like the old days when uh, the drive-in movie theaters, when they when the drive-in wasn't going, what did they have? They had swap meets and flea markets, and people brought their stuff, and they traded it. It's really not that difficult. You might have a surplus of X. You know, you bought 10,000 rounds of 22 LR. And you need some 9 mil. And that guy over there, he's got 9 mil and he needs 22 or 45 or you name the numbers. Barter with your buddies. You know, let them know. And the more people that get involved, the better you are. Because uh, right now there's ammunition in the United States of America. It's not at Walmart and most of it's not in the stores. You know where it is. It's in your neighbor's gun locker. It's in your gun locker. Uh, The guys that ran out and, uh, you know, bought ammunition for guns they didn't even own. And thinking that they could trade it in the future. Well, now's the time, you know, and it's not really all that difficult. And I think it's really, it's a, an idea whose time has come. So uh, <laughs> your first tidbit from student of the gun radio and Paul Markle is set up ammo swap Saturday at your local club. And if you guys do that, I want you to, uh, I want you to follow us. I'd like for you to follow us on Facebook. It's very simple. You just go to Facebook and type in student of the gun. And we've got our thing right there. You can like us. And uh, if you have convinced your local vice president or president of your gun club to have an ammo swap Saturday, post it, you know, send us a note, say, Hey, Bloomington, Indiana, or uh, Provo, Utah, or wherever, you know, the, uh, the long range gun club is going to do ammo swap Saturday. Uh, we'd love to hear about it. Now, since you guys are my new captive audience, uh, I wanted to talk to you and make sure that you're all aware of a fantastic shooting program called the 4-H shooting sports program. Now, a lot of you out there might be thinking, well, 4-H, isn't that about cows and chickens and, you know, farm activities? Well, yes, it is. It's about agriculture, but it's also about shooting sports and youth development. Now, back in the mid to late 90s, they came up with an organized shooting sports program for the 4-H. And I became involved in the year 2000 when a club opened up in my local county. And what I wanted to be an adult volunteer, but to be an adult volunteer for the 4-H shooting sports, the first thing you need to do is you need to attend a three-day instructor training seminar. And where I was in Ohio at the time, they held them in the fall and in the spring. The great thing about 4-H shooting sports is their volunteers are highly trained and highly skilled. And everybody is a volunteer. Nobody gets paid to teach these kids. It's, it's all, you know, the goodness of their heart. But the great thing about the 4-H shooting sports adult education is you go down there and let's say you are a shotgunner and you want to teach shotgun to these young people. Fantastic. You go down and you take a weekend's worth of shotgun training. And it is actually instructor training. They teach you how to instruct people. It's not just about shooting. It's how do I get through? How do I work with these young people? Now, one thing that I remembered, uh, it sticks out in my mind. When I went down there for my very first instructor workshop, and we were having the, the, the first evening session, training session, one of the instructors got up and he said, 4-H shooting sports is not about shooting. And we all kind of looked at him, all we knew, guys. And he said, the 4-H shooting sports is all about youth development that's why we're here we like to shoot and shooting is fun but the primary goal of the 4-h shooting sports is youth development 
We use the shooting sports to get through to these kids, to work with the kids, because it's fun, it's enjoyable, and it's what we like to do. But our primary goal, it's not just shooting, it's teaching these kids to progress from young people to young adults to productive members of our society. Now, I think that uh, a lot of you out there understand that there are two Americas when it comes to raising children. We have America, number one, that, think, that looks at children as these fragile little creatures that have to, be, they have to be protected and sheltered from the world. We can't you know, allow their, their uh, ego or their self-esteem to be damaged in any way. We can't give them failing grades, even though they didn't do the work, because that might hurt their self-esteem. And we've been doing that for a while in this in the United States of America, and right now we're reaping the uh, the fruits there in the seat that we've planted. We have thirty year olds who are still living in their parents' basement uh, because they were never taught; they were always sheltered. And we have a you know America number two is the America that I like to live in, and we view our kids not as fragile little creatures, but as adults in training, because really that's what kids are. Uh, kids don't stay kids very long. They don't stay kids uh, their entire lives. This isn't Peter Pan. Eventually they grow up. Uh, you take this from somebody who raised three kids who are now uh, fully grown. And what we want to do, we can't, we cannot shelter our children from the realities of the world. The best thing that we can do is we can teach them, we can instruct them, we can help them to deal with the successes and the failures that they're going to encounter when they get out into that big world. And right now in the United States, we have children that are almost, if not totally, detached from reality. They live in an artificial world. Their music is it's artificial. They can't even touch it. It's, uh, you know, it's a digital file. Uh, their video games, if they fail, they just hit reset and they start all over again. They don't even have actual verbal communication with each other. They text each other. The 4-H shooting sports provides young people the opportunity to do something tangible, to do something real, to actually get out and get hands-on. And the fantastic thing about the shooting sports is you don't have to be the top 1% athlete in your class or your age group to participate. It doesn't matter whether you're a boy or a girl, whether you're 12, 14, 18 years old. If you're physically able to show up, you're physically able to participate. And uh, the 4-H Shooting Sports does a fantastic job getting everyone involved regardless. And uh, you're, you're competing against your peers, but the truth is when you go out there on the trap field or the rifle range or pistol range or you've got a bow and arrow in your hand, you're competing against yourself. You're, tr you're seeking self-improvement, and that's something that we really owe our kids. We owe them that to show them how to do it. And, uh, you know, when that uh, orange clay is flying across the sky, it doesn't care about your self-esteem. It doesn't care about fair. All that clay knows is if you don't do what you're supposed to do and strike it with the shot, it's going to keep on going. And if you missed it, it's because you didn't do it right. And you need to discipline your mind and your body and do it right. And think about the first time you ever you ever you know, used a firearm, whether it was, you know, rifle or pistol or shotgun. Did, did you hit the X ring the first time? No, you probably didn't. You probably, I guess you could say, you might have failed. You failed to hit the X ring. You failed to hit the clay. It wasn't the end of the world. You realized, hey, I didn't do it. What do I have to do to improve? And that's what the 4-H shooting sports is all about. It teaches kids self-discipline, both mental discipline and physical discipline. It, it helps them set goals. Uh, you know, where am I today? And that, that's something that the uh, adult instructors always work with the kids. They're like, okay, today we're doing X. And they help them keep track. All right, we, shot, we threw 25 clays and you broke three. What's your goal? Well, my goal is to break five next time. Fantastic. Let's try and break five next time. But it's real. Now, the 4-H shooting sports, if you don't have a club, you know, where you live, uh, number one, you might want to think about starting one. And if you do have a club and you're not involved yet, I've got a great way for you to make an introduction to that local club. Right now, uh, we have a situation with 4-H 
very similar to what every other shooter is going through. When I was with the 4-H and when I was working with my local club, generally if you've got a uh, you've got a club meeting coming up on Saturday, one of the adult instructors or a couple of them will stop at the local Walmart or the local hardware store or whatever and pick up the ammunition that you're going to need for the following Saturday. And you thought, well, I'm going to go tomorrow, I'll pick up 1,000 rounds of 22, and I'll meet you guys at the range on Saturday morning. We well, can't do that anymore. You can't just run to the uh, hardware store or Walmart and pick up 1,000 rounds of 22 for the club meeting because it's not there. Uh, and in the shooting sports, generally, they, they don't really stash or hoard ammunition. They don't stockpile it. They go through it pretty quickly. If you're one of those guys who is or girls that happens to be sitting on five, 10,000 rounds of 22 long rifle and you're feeling charitable and you believe that what I'm saying is true and that the 4-H shooting sports program is worthwhile, this would be a great time for you to make an introduction to them. Find out when their local club meeting is. Go there and say, hey, you know, my name's Bob, Jim, Sally, and uh, I don't have any kids in 4-H right now, but I would like to donate a thousand rounds of 22 long rifle to your club. Could you use it? And I can guarantee you, you're going to be welcomed in with open arms. And not only that, but I can also guarantee you that that 4-H shooting sports club will use that ammunition very wisely. And a lot of young people will get a lot out of it. Now I'm not telling you to give them your whole stash. I would never tell you that, but if, if you've got some that you can spare and you'd like to see young people, because Let's let's face it. Young people become adults, and they become our shooting sports peers. Uh, I've been in the, involved in the 4-H shooting sports long enough now that kids who were my 4-H camp kids, they're not kids anymore. They all grew up. They graduated from high school. They graduated from college. They're out there getting jobs and getting married and having babies for Pete's sake. And these were all kids that I, when I see them, I think, wow. I remember when you were 12 years old and you showed up to the first meeting and I taught you how to shoot a 22 rifle and, and look at you now, you're, you're a fireman and you've got a wife. Uh, these kids learn the skills that they're going to take with them their entire life. Now, how do you find a local shoot for a shooting sports club near you? Just, I know that you know how to use a computer because you're listening to this show. Just punch in 4-H shooting sports and your local town, and it should give you all you need to know. Now, the main site is 4-H shootingsports.org. And if you go there, that's the National 4-H Shooting Sports. They can help you start a club or they can help you find a club near you. So if you have the opportunity, I would definitely consider supporting the 4-H shooting sports. The next topic of discussion is one that I really had to consider whether or not I wanted to talk about it. But as they say, silence is equals consent. And I cannot consent to the advice, to the personal protection and home defense advice being dispensed by the vice president of the United States today. Uh, (laughs) Where do we start? Well, number one, if you've been paying attention, you know about Joe Biden's shotgun advice. First, he said, You don't need a big, mean, nasty black rifle because they're hard to shoot. I don't know which rifles he's shooting. Probably not the same ones that you and I are, but they're too difficult to shoot. It's easier to shoot a shotgun. Okay. And uh, not only did he tell everyone to stop buying rifles but to go out and buy shotguns, he went and claimed that the advice that he gives to his wife, Jill, is if she believes that there's trouble, if there's an intruder or someone outside, that she should take her shotgun, walk out onto the patio, and fire two shots in the air. And the intruder's going to run away and everything's going to be great. Well, from a tactical standpoint, if you have a firearm that holds a grand total of two rounds and you use both of those rounds as noisemakers, now you're standing there with an empty gun. And I really, really hope that luck is with you, and if there is a bad guy out there, that they have gone away. However, we have a little bit of a problem there. Right now in the United States, we are a nation of laws. And one of the laws that deals with deadly force says you can only use or threaten to use deadly force if you believe that you are in fear of death or serious bodily harm. 
Now, we know what death is, right? It's assuming room temperature. But what is serious bodily harm? Serious bodily harm is any harm that would cause you permanent injury, disfigurement, require prolonged hospitalization or rehabilitation, which would include beatings, broken bones, rape, and so forth. All right, so now we know what deadly force is. If you feel that you are in fear of death or serious bodily harm, then you are justified in using a firearm. Now, if you do not feel that you are, you are not justified in discharging a firearm in the direction of a human being. We don't use firearms as noisemakers. All right? If you do that, let's say there's somebody out in the driveway, you don't know who it is, so you just walk out on the porch and start cranking off rounds. Well, it happens to be the local lineman for the county or the electric meter reader or what have you. They're going to call the police, and you're probably going to be arrested, and your defense is going to be, well, I just fired warning shots. Well, here's what happens in the real world. You say you fired a warning shot, and the next thing you know, you're charged with aggravated menacing or aggravated assault, and you say, whoa, I shouldn't be charged with aggravated menacing. The vice president told me it was okay. Guess what? The vice president's not going to show up in court to be your expert witness. Okay. Also, keep this in mind. If you fire a shotgun or any other firearm as a warning shot, now there's a big difference between pointing something straight, a gun, straight directly up in the air. You discharge it. The projectile goes all the way up until it runs out of speed, and then it falls back to earth under the power of gravity only. Okay. That isn't quite so bad. However, if you angle a gun over someone's head and fire it, that projectile still has a lot of juice behind it. And if you deliberately missed your intended target, where are those projectiles going? Well, you don't know, do you? If a projectile from your gun strikes someone or something that it should not have, you, ladies and gentlemen, are responsible. You can't fire rounds indiscriminately all over the landscape, and then go to court and say, ah, oh, well, you know, Joe Biden said it was okay. I could just fire warning shots. Guess what? Every projectile that you fire out of a pistol, rifle, or shotgun might as well have your name and Social Security number inscribed on it because it is you and you alone who are responsible for where those rounds end up. You can't just say, oops, my bad. I'll try again next time. That's not how it works in the real world. Now, apparently some of uh, Vice President Biden's, apparently his handlers got to him and they said, hey, you need to you need to come up with a better plan than just walk out on the porch and shoot two rounds up in the air. And so he said, oh, OK, I've got a new plan. If you're scared or if you feel that uh, there's somebody bad outside your house, just point the shotgun at the door and shoot through the door again. Not very good advice. Now, you guys out there in the audience, if you're trained shooters and you know the four universal safety rules, what's number four? It's know your target, what's around it, and what's beyond it. Again, going back to we are responsible for every round we launch, we don't shoot at shadows, we don't shoot at scary sounds. Now, there's a difference between being startled and being in fear of of death or serious bodily harm. I'll give you a good example. You wake up 2 o'clock in the morning, 2.15. The dogs are barking and going crazy. You come out of a deep sleep and you're startled. You grab a gun and you see a shadow downstairs. You point your shotgun and you fire. The shadow turns out to be your spouse. Could be your wife, could be your husband. They didn't want to wake you, but they couldn't sleep, so they decided, well, rather than just sit here awake, I'll run to Walmart and I'll get those couple of things that I didn't get today. You've just shot your spouse because you followed the vice president's advice. You were startled, and you shot at a shadow. Are you gonna, how are you going to feel for the rest of your life? Or you, have the, uh, you live in a neighborhood with a mentally challenged young man, and uh, even though he has the mentality of an 8-year-old, he has the body of a 35-year-old man. He's outside your house rattling on your doorknob, mistakenly thinking that it's his house, I don't know. You take the vice president's advice and you pump two rounds of double lot buck through the front door. You just shot little Jimmy, the mentally challenged neighbor boy. Do you have mirrors in your house? Are you ever going to be able to look in a mirror again knowing that you did that? I would think probably not. 
the advice that the vice president gave, number one, to fire rounds indiscriminately in the air, and then number two, to just point your shotgun at the door and shoot through the door, is not only bad advice, it's reckless. It is negligent. And if you follow it, guess what? You are not the vice president, and you're not going to get off the hook, ladies and gentlemen. You are going to be held responsible. (laughs) As we tape this today, that has already happened. Someone followed the vice president's advice, pointed a gun at a door, and just let her loose. Guess what that person got? They got arrested and charged. Uh, Need I say more? If you need professional advice, if you are a novice gun owner, or even if you're an experienced gun owner, you should always train. Get training from people that actually carry guns for a living, not people that have 24-7 bodyguards. Did anyone else pick up on the fact that Jill Biden has 24-7 Secret Service bodyguards? I'm not really sure how often Jill Biden grabs a shotgun and walks out to her patio. I think the Secret Service has probably got that covered. But for you and I who don't have Secret Service protection and have to protect ourselves, we need to get our advice not from people that have 24-7 bodyguards, but from people that actually carry guns and do it for a living. I would highly recommend that you get professional training. And if if you're one of the tens of thousands of brand new gun owners, uh, and, and we love you, we're glad that you're under the tent now, we're glad that you're here with us, and you probably have a lot of questions, that is why we're here. That's what Student of the Gun is all about. Now, before I let you go, I want to thank you for joining me for this inaugural episode of Student of the Gun Radio. I want to invite you to join us again next week. Again, we are very pleased to be a part of the Firearms Radio Network. Now, if you'd like to follow us, you can follow us at studentofthegunradio.com. Or you can go to studentofthegun.com. Now, if you go to studentofthegun.com, you can watch our show. A new episode airs every week. You can read articles. You can visit the Student of the Gun store. That's right. You didn't think I would uh, leave you without a store, did you? No. We have DVDs. We have books. We have T-shirts. We have all that good stuff, all of your Student of the Gun gear. We want to thank Keltec Firearms. We want to thank them and uh, make sure you check them out at keltechweapons.com. We also want to take time to thank Crossbreed Holsters. Check them out at crossbreedholsters.com. And we'll see you again next week.